This episode is brought to you by Portland Distro. If you like underground music, movies, and more, go to portlanddistro.com for licensed merch, vinyl, CDs, and more. Plug in the discount code 10 off T E N O F F for a 10% discount at portlanddistro.com. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Everything Went Black podcast. My good friend Paul Aloisio returns. Paul is the guitarist and singer in Restless Spirit, a band that we toured with last year and uh, we've become really good friends with those guys. Paul has returned and is ready to talk about the brand new Restless Spirit record, After Image, and some of the things that he endured in his personal life to make this record. And it's, uh, we go deep in this episode, and um, yeah, it was uh, definitely a heavy trip that uh, Paul had to deal with. And uh, yeah, it, it just adds another whole dimension to enjoying the music. After you listen to this, head on over to the other Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse shows. On Monday, we have Brandon Legion bringing you Horror Wolf 666. On Tuesday, of course, is Into the Necrosphere, brought to you by Jackie Smith. Wednesday is today. Everything went black. I return tomorrow with my co-hosts Jeff Cash. I return tomorrow with my co-hosts Jeff Kashid and Mike Scandato for Necromaniacs. On Sunday, Carl Hikara brings you Soul Knox, and Carl and I have been doing some really cool collaborations with our Darkness Weaves sub series, where we talk about Carl Edward Wagner. If you want to support the show, in addition to listening to it and sharing it with your friends, you can head on over to Patreon. Everything Went Black Patreon starts at $1 a month. You get access to all the bonus material. At $5 a month, you get access to the bonus material plus early access to these shows. For $25, you can become a sponsor. Access to all the material and you get an ad read once a month for your project, your business, your band, whatever it is. And that can be for one month or forever, for all eternity, if you so wish. Paul, it's great hearing from you again, man. And um, just a few weeks ago, it was really cool to see you guys play down at uh, Hell in the Harbor at that uh, after party that we all played together. Yeah, dude, that that was a great experience. I, w- I was kind of worried because our time slot, we started playing right as Cannibal Corpse was ending. So I was like, oh man, we're in trouble, you know? But um, there there were a bunch of people in there specifically for our set. So that was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And then I found out, um, you know, people kept piling on and piling in, piling in. And I found out that uh, there was a huge line to get in. People really wanted to catch it. I don't know. I guess enough people have seen Cannibal Corpse in their life. And they want to just like check out uh, the after party and maybe, you know, be indoors after being outside by the harbor all day in a smaller venue. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I was real concerned about it because we went on, you know, last. So I was like, damn, yeah. I hope, I hope there's like any, you know people here, you know, but there was a great show, actually. Dude, it was packed for you guys. And you guys sounded awesome. You, you guys did. Uh, a Gigi Allen cover and a Motorhead cover too, which I was like, hell yeah, this is that Motorhead cover was sick. Those those are both on that Ex Oblivion single that came out last year, so that was definitely uh, it. We played all the actual songs off of that record, so I was pretty excited about doing that too. Yeah, no, that's super cool because I know bands will put out stuff like that. You know, they'll do like a bunch of covers and then they'll just like play them once in a while. 
So to hear like a bunch off of that, especially I think you guys almost played you played those two covers like maybe back to back, if my memory serves correctly. Yeah, they were they were towards the end. They were they were the last two songs, and that was kind of a good way to end that end the night. I think you know. Yeah, no, because I mean it's an after party, uh, so I, I I think that was a really good choice. But I found out that um, a lot of people that you know were trying to catch some of Cannibal Corpse and then see our set. There were a bunch of clubs in there, and so the line to get in was really long, and security was like really strict. Like even with me, I was playing every single time I went back in, because I, you know, like throughout the night I would go and like I wanted to get some food. And when when our set was done, there was like there was no food available in that general area, so I had to go out, come back in. I got ID'd every time, even with my artist bracelet. So I found out uh, from a bunch of people that. A lot of people that were really excited to see us actually like just like cut the line and try to like sneak in. So by the end of our set, it was it was pretty full. And, I, you know, I think competing with Cannibal Corpse's draw to have anybody in there was really cool. <laughs> yeah. And, no, uh, great, man. You know, totally. It, it was a really good vibe. The fest. Did you have much time to check out the fest as, as a whole? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we got in into uh, Baltimore to the grounds at, like, I don't know, like four maybe. So I got I got a chance to see everybody. I saw the dwarves. You know, I did not see Cannibal, but, you know, I've seen them a bunch. I'm going to see them again, actually, in September. But, uh, yeah, I caught, I caught a lot of bands and a um, bunch of, you know, ran into a bunch of people. And that's what I like about those festivals, you know what I mean? It's just, like, it's cool to run into people you haven't seen in a while as well as see a bunch of great bands too, you know? It was like, it was super overwhelming for me, to be honest. It was like, there's too much to do. So many people. But the great thing was, you know, uh, we were doing two dates with Black Tusk. We did a date with Acid Witch. And then, you know, we have history with you as well. So it felt like a big, like, you know, family reunion, getting to see everybody, like you said. So, I, I had a great time. I think it was a really great festival. And for, for my tastes, I, I'm really into it. Like, I know a lot of people were missing Maryland Death Fest, but for the music that I'm into, I, I think Hell in the Heart was sick. I wish that uh, we could have stayed the next day for High on Fire. Oh, yeah, that would be um, great. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've seen them a few times, but I haven't seen them recently, so that, that would be sick, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, all, all in all, it was great. But for me... You know, funnily enough, I talk about this all the time. I don't do well with big crowds. Um, you know, as the singer <laughs> of a heavy metal band, I don't like crowds or people, too many people around me. Um, so, I mean, it was so many people packed in such a tight space. I had to keep, like, taking breaks and just, like, going and, like, walking around, just, like, getting some, some quiet. Because, you know, like, you go to, like, well, you've played Ozfest, but you know that's usually at like you know big festival grounds, and this was this was not a very big space. Um, Dude, the most out of control thing I've ever been involved with is Roskilde Festival in Denmark. Man, it was like uh, it wasn't a metal fest; it was like Paul McCartney was the headliner, and uh, <laughs> it was like there was all these multiple stages and this gigantic ground, and it's summertime in Europe and. Europeans go buck in the summertime with festivals. They just, that's, they have like all this time off and they just go out and do their thing. And it was like so many people, like, like luckily at Roskilde, you don't have to go out in the main grounds. Like you can get around. They have these vans that take you around behind the backstages areas. Yeah. But uh, for one moment, I went out into the actual field where everyone was chilling and it was like completely overwhelming, man. Yeah, I that to me that would not it wouldn't be very fun. I would probably just hang out, like you said, in like the little vehicles escorting me around. Yeah, yeah totally. And, you know, and, and I love live music and stuff like that. But it's also you know when you know you got to play, it's like you you got to stay in the zone. You got a job to do, uh, especially if it's way later in the day. So it's like you know. You don't want to, you see so many people and I, I'm a singer, so I, I'll be like screaming over everybody and talking to people I haven't seen. I'm like, I'm going to ruin my set. So I, I got to chill. Yeah. It wrecks your voice. Like when you're like, you, you, you take it for granted that just talking to people, like sometimes like if you're talking to a lot of people during the day and you have to sing at the end of the night, it, it definitely fucks with your voice for sure. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, like 
I feel bad sometimes for friends that come out to shows that I haven't seen in a while because I really want to talk to them and I really want to hang out. But, um, you know, especially if a lot of people come out and it's like towards the end of a tour, it's almost like I'm not avoiding them, but it's like, hey, like I can't really talk that much right now because my voice is killing me. And if I'm yelling over this house music or this other band, even, you know, like green rooms get loud. They're not really sound insulated at most venues. You hear everything. So, yeah, resting your voice for me is a must because I I don't even scream, you know. Like, I feel like I could probably get Mark, you know, Mark in the band. He uh, he does the death metal vocals sometimes for some of our songs and he can get away with it because he just pushes it and pushes it and pushes it. But if I push it, you know, I can I, I can miss like you know a couple notes and stuff, and for me that's no good because it's actual singing. Uh, so it's it's definitely a lot of rest involved, and and big fests like that are kind of like oh man, it'd be great if I could just like play at nine a.m. to a full crowd and then just <laughs> <laughs> scream my head off the rest of the day and just you know go crazy. Yeah, it was great, man. I I really I was really stoked to hung with you guys and checked you out you know this past weekend my girlfriend was like restless spirit is playing in the kingsland but it was after it was like later i guess you guys because i texted you and i was like what's this what's the deal with this show is it like in the afternoon or night or what's up because we were actually going to come out for it but it was after the fact yeah so that was a matinee and um I, I mean, for a matinee, it was all right, but it's also it's difficult on a Saturday. You know, even even though it is a Saturday in Brooklyn, a lot of our friends like you live in Jersey, right? I just moved to Jersey City, so it's like way closer to everything now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, you know, it's not you know most people they you know you hear a show going on in Brooklyn and you sort of all right, I'll do what I got to do during the day and then. I'll go to the show later, 5, 6 p.m. You know how it is. Even like a, a, a normal show, it, the crowd really starts coming in at, you know, 6, 7, 8. So I think we played at like 3.45. And uh, it, it was it was much better than I thought. Uh, but still, it was kind of tricky with like, I don't maybe I think like the flyer really didn't. Or maybe it was kind of like we possibly drop the ball like saying hey this is a matinee be here early because uh, we're not used to playing that we never play matinee so that in oh, itself yeah. was strange you know i mean for the kind of stuff that we're doing it's like it doesn't make any sense to play in the middle of the day i mean unless you're playing like you know you we talked about these festivals is a different story because it's like the way it's scheduled is different and there's you know mad people there anyway but for this kind of stuff man like you know playing a club unless it's like you're a kid and you're going to see like some like youth crew band or something like that then it, it's cool you know and there's you can't get into the bar at night to go see a, a real show you can go and check out the matinees and stuff you know what i mean yeah i mean when i was in a hardcore band with my younger brother i we would play like sunday matinees all the time and they were great on long island but it's like the hardcore crowd is different because a lot of those people you know they have such a built-in community and you just really go to hang out with your friends and you don't give a shit who's playing the show yeah. as long as your friends are there but you know for for a metal band especially a lot of bands that weren't exactly local to the area it, it was a little more difficult and i i do think that we probably could have done a better job on our end at you know promoting it but uh with everything we have going on with like the final finishes on you know getting the album out and releasing the first single it's sort of like that's where my head was at not so much a matinee and you want to take every single show you play seriously no matter what you know you never just want to be like ah eh, whatever no absolutely not that's like that's the sign of a, a weak uh performer <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah yeah a hundred percent but also headspace is very important and uh with everything going on it was like just hard to really my, I just didn't think to be like, hey, let me tell everybody I know in the area, if you want to come, you should come early. Well, um, yeah, I mean, my, I you know, I play you guys and, um, you know, I, I shared your, your stuff with my girlfriend and, and she's like one of these, like, she scans the internet for shows all the time. So it's like, she was the one who found out about it. She was like, oh, your well, Restless Spirit is playing. You want to go? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. Let's, I thought it was a nighttime thing. And then she's like, I think it's a matinee. And I'm like, wait, so hence you know, the text message. And it, I guess you guys just finished playing when you got my message. So I was like, oh shit, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. But it's all right. We'll be ba- we'll be back late August Hell if you yeah. want to hang. Yeah, no, so. no doubt, man. I mean, we're definitely going to come out for that for sure. Sweet. And I like the Kingsland, actually. I, I wasn't a big fan of it until actually uh, we played there, you you and I. Yeah. Uh, on, at that Evokin show. Right. And it, it, that was that was a great night, dude. That was an awesome fucking night. That really changed my opinion on that venue. It, it really depends on on the bill, you know. I mean, um, it's a cool room. I think the sound system there is pretty decent, and um, you know they had the pizza and all that stuff too, which is always good. Yeah, and, uh, you know that that part you can always park out there too, which is another thing I like about that that part of the neighborhood. And um, I used to live right up the street from there too, and. Um, it used to be a pizza place. Like I remember, like for years, I lived right up the street, and there was like some pizza spot there. And then someday, one day, I, I saw a venue open called the Kingsland. I'm like, the Kingsland? Like, where the hell is this place? Said like, Greenpoint. And sure enough, I'm just, it's that spot that used to be uh, just a pizza parlor, and I never realized it was big enough to even make be a venue, you know. But they would have like shows, like I Hate God played there. Like there was all sorts of, you know, really killer shows happening there, and. um so when we started doing shows there, it was like a small enough where you could really pack it out and get people in there, and and the sound system was decent, and the logistics of you know maneuvering uh you know New York City parking and all that's pretty pretty good, you know. Yeah, it's definitely also a different vibe than you know Vitus, which is just the place to be in Brooklyn now, and they have such yeah. a great. They have such a great built-in crowd that you really never have to worry because people just go there to hang out. You know you're going to play with someone if you play at Vitus. Yeah, that's um, that's true. Uh, Kingsland's got a grimier like vibe, which I always relate more to that. I think you know. Yeah, no, definitely, and the parking is great because parking near Vitus is it, it gets pretty brutal. <laughs> the funny thing about that, even once again, just showing like you know how fucking out of you know just out of touch i am too because it's like the uh out of touch isn't really the right term but like when i first you know because i used to live in greenpoint and that neighborhood was this desolate place where no one went to and when vitus first opened up it was like you you could have your your pick there'd be open spots you know you can just roll up park two you know a block away and you were there but now it's like this completely that neighborhood is just overrun right now and it's impossible to like find places to park or you know it's crazy yeah no it it's always a challenge it's like load out get the fuck out of there and hope that the bus doesn't come and start screaming at you yeah that's not it's it's definitely uh you know they're not doing anyone any favors by having a bus stop like literally right where you load in you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah i know there's like every time like it, it for in our experience for some reason it's like i don't know like well it's probably not just us it's probably just the time we have to load in but it's like every time it's like is the bus going to be here this time or not and it almost always is so we'll, we'll like throw our shit on the sidewalk and it's like get out of there <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so it's always an adventure man so so now um as far as records go so what's what's the news what's the update on the new record let's let's talk about that Okay, so the new record is called After Image, and it's going to be out uh, October 6th through Magnetic Eye Records. They put out the re-release of our most recent album, uh, Blood of the Old Gods. I I guess they heard it, and, uh, you know, they were super, super into it, but we had already, we put it out ourselves already. So they were like, we want to be involved and re-release it, and also... Why do you guys want to be on a label? Because you're doing so well yourself. And you label. I pressed my own records. I, you know, I paid for my own PR. We did it. We ran it like you'd run a, a real label. But it, you know, it wasn't really real. I mean, I guess it kind of was because we had an LLC and everything. But um, basically, you know, uh, the, the head of the label was like, you know, why, why do you want to be on a label? And I was like, honestly, I think Blood did really well, um, as as well as it can do on its own, on our own. So I feel like your guys' expertise would help a lot. And the fact that you really like it and you want more from us is much better than being picked up by a huge label. It's like, yeah, throw these guys a couple of fucking bucks and see what happens. You know, they're like super hands-on. 
And uh, it really inspired us to really challenge ourselves on the next record. So this will actually be our first proper record on the label. That's awesome. You know, it's cool that they, they repress or re reissued the older, the older record too, because that's, that's a solid album. And like, yeah, you know, just to get, maybe get in front of more people, you know, that that's always a good thing too. The whole thing was a shock. I mean, we, we pressed 200 records and we thought we were going to be sitting on them until the end of time. Uh, and the first single we had come out was actually funnily enough, October. Uh, but the album didn't come out until December. And by the beginning of November, or sorry, the beginning of December, uh, all 200 records were already gone, like pre-order, like sold for like a band that, you know, pretty unknown, but had not really been doing much because of you know, in the past couple of years, we were just, you know, kind of just went unnoticed. And well, uh, so it was great. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to add that selling, you know, like a uh, independent band selling 200 pieces of product, you know, like like at records, not streams or, you know, Bandcamp downloads or whatever is actually really good, man, especially with doing it on your own like this, you know, not having like a, an office filled of, with people who are taking care of everything, you know? Yeah, I mean, that doesn't even include uh, CDs. And, you know, we, we sold a lot and it was just such a, it was, it was super humbling because, you know, it was super grassroots. We did it ourselves. We really believed in it. But at the same time, you have this worry when you put a piece of music into the world after not really doing so much um, for a while with this specific band and then to have it just sort of give us all these amazing opportunities. I mean, if it wasn't for blood, we wouldn't, we would never tour with you guys. I'm sure about that. So it's like the friendships we've also made, the relationships we've had with people. It's just, it, it, it it's been amazing. And I, I really appreciate uh, magnetic eye for taking us on and believing in us um, and helping us push things further. And I really think that uh, after image is, is a step up in every single way um, without retreading old ground. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I did not want to uh, recreate what we did on blood musically uh i was like it's our third album our second album sounds different from our first album the third album's going to sound different from the prior two because to me you know some bands can get away with just like making albums that sound really similar and very alike their whole career and it works sometimes for them but for me i get really bored so on blood like they start calling us like progressive sludge I, I hate and, terms, man. That's like the worst thing in the world to like when these fucking guys like come up with names for the shit that you're doing. I hate that so much. If you give me a term and you try and live what we opposite. So <laughs> that we were like, all right, on this album, there's no way anyone's going to, you know, classify us as progressive sludge. Not that I really, you know, had a problem. I know people got to, you know, they got to classify it so they know what to listen to. But I was like, cool. All right. That's what, that's what that album is. You can call it that this album. We're shortening the songs. There's going to be less, uh, you know, interludes. And I thought like the interludes, I even, I even made them to sort of, you know, you can listen to them on their own. Like the first track is an acoustic track, but it's not just like amb ambiance, you know, yeah. it's an actual, it's an instrumental song. And I was like, all right, we're going to do on, on this new album, we'll do one instrumental, but it has to fit and it's going to be heavy as fuck um, instead of just like a nice little break from the rest. Like I really just wanted this album to be crushing and emotional and I wanted it to chronicle what I was going through at the time because to me, that's the most important part about music, you know? I'm not, we're not a band that thing about Dungeons and Dragons and shit which is cool, no problem with that. But for me, I, I just personally couldn't do it. You, an album to me is a snapshot in time. I can go back and listen to it and see this is where I was, good or bad. And uh, this album was very bad, a very bad time in my life. Really? And in, oh, oh man, 
man, holy crap. It was the worst period of my entire life. And so what I did was I channeled that into music. And uh, here we are. <laughs> well, that that's always a good thing, man. It's like when you take, uh, you know, something negative and there's like a certain cathartic element to making something good out of it, you know? Yeah, I mean, even even blood was uh, that was based off something bad that happened to me too, but it wasn't as severe. That was, you know, there were a bunch of people in my life who I, I thought they were really good people, and uh, I really looked up to them. And then it turned out they were just kind of scum of the earth, and it all came out. And I was like, oh my god, who, what the fuck? Like you can't like trust anyone. And uh, but there was a little hope to the album too. It was a little bit of about redemption not so much on anybody else's part, but on my own, that we can get through this, I can get through this, you know. It ended with a little bit of optimism, maybe. It was ambiguous. This album, so for context, After Image, um, you know, that's when you, you look at, uh, let's say, like a bright object or something like that, you stare at it for a while, and uh, once that stimuli is removed, the, uh, you'll still see an imprint of it. So it's still there. And uh, what happened was in the past two years, I lost three of the closest people in my entire life. And uh, last July, I lost my stepfather who helped raise me. He was my absolute hero. And uh, he unfortunately passed away from, uh, you know, dementia, oh, Alzheimer's, would and. You know, I had to, I, to protect his dignity, I won't say what I experienced, yeah, but no, it, it, totally. it was, it, it was cruel. It, it was cruel. It was a cruel joke. And I, I was just like this, I, I felt I had two ways of going about it. Right. So that's also what the album cover is. There's a figure and in one hand, there's like a, a bright light. And the other is a downward turned sword. And I thought there are two ways I can go about all of this trauma that I've dealt with my entire life. This felt like the final blow, you know, because even before that, I've lost so many, so many of my friends to, you know, drugs and addiction. And, you know, I've had a lot of trauma in my life. And, and this just felt like the, the final one. It was like, I have a choice, right? I could either, you know, follow the bright light and, and do what I need to do and uh, overcome this or then, you know, with the sword, uh, sort of that represents damnation and I can go down a dark path. And I wrote it as a cautionary tale for myself, right? So I was like, this is cathartic. It, it'll rid myself of the, the, my demons, let's not have any positivity here because I also feel sometimes when you're in a bad place, you don't really want to hear that things are going to be okay. You want to relate to something, um, which is, you know, the title track marrow it, you know, it's about my experience and, you know, grieving and almost like begging, you know, things for them to not be this way and yeah. hoping against hope that things will be different. Um, so I, I wrote it as a cautionary tale to myself. And uh, sadly enough, <laughs> it became pro prophetic because I ended up going down a very, very dark path. And there, there were a couple moments there where I was like, this is not good. I, you know, I'm not listening to my own advice. And it was like I wrote the soundtrack to my downfall, truly. And it got scary for a bit, man. I'm telling you, it was a rough fucking year for me. I mean, dude, I'm early, sorry to hear that, man. That that's you know, it breaks my heart to hear that, man. Really. Thanks, but you know, it's all right because this is how we learn, and I'm in a better spot now. Um, but it, you know, I I needed I needed to go down that path. I needed to see the alternative. I needed to see how my life could be if I didn't take my responsibility for my own, you know, happiness and mental health and, you know, relationships with friends and family and significant others seriously. So, uh, you know, I went through a bunch of trials 
and many, many, many tribulations. And I can say that it was probably the, well, not, not probably, it was the hardest year of my entire life, but I made it through and I'm here, right? So it, <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be a cautionary tale as to, you know, what I'm not going to do, but it became predicting the future. And uh, so for a while, things were bad, but I'm, I'm good now. Everything is good. Uh, I, I learned a lot of, of valuable lessons this year, and I needed that, I feel, um, because a lot of people myself included, I just push myself to just go, go, go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, things are bad, but it'll be fine. You just ignore it. You sweep it under the rug and just keep doing what you're doing. But then, you know, you play with fire enough and you're bound to get burned. And, yeah, uh, man, that, that's, that's intense, man. And I'm, I'm glad you're doing, I'm glad you have music. I mean, think about what would happen, what the alternatives would be if you did not have this outlet to put your energy into during a time like this, you know? I mean, I've seen the alternatives, you know, like I yeah. said, uh, my, my, one of my best friends is from kindergarten, you know, I had to watch him, you know, deteriorate and eventually pass away. And, uh, you know, numerous friends of drug overdoses at, at young ages. And I, I've been through a lot in my, in my 32 years of, of living, but I, I never processed it the way that, uh, I should have in a healthy way. And eventually if you don't, it catches up with you, man. And it caught up with me. But uh, I'm a stubborn motherfucker, and I needed to learn these hard lessons. And things are really good now. I mean, I could say I'm in a better place now than I've probably been in the past, like, 10 years. But, uh, you know, I I'm really good at rebounding. <laughs> I'll just say that much. I've learned. Uh and, you know, digging myself out of holes I get myself into. But essentially, that, you know, that's the story of the album. And uh, it's not only about, you know, loss, but how you deal with it. And it manifests itself in a lot of ways, both good and bad. And I just wanted to, to talk about the bad. I thought it would be cathartic. And it, and it was. Um, but I wasn't taking my own advice seriously um i had so much anger inside of myself this is the angriest album we've ever put out absolutely um for example you know the title track that we we're lucky enough to have uh, not the title track the track that we were lucky enough to have you on oh, shadow oh, command yeah uh, that's an angry song man i was just you know I, I was deep in my grief and just i was just lashing out at everyone i just you know, I just, it was just about kind of, you know, hatred towards everyone and just, you know, uh, <laughs> nobody can tell you nothing. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure you felt that too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Just like overwhelming rage. And I've never been an angry person before, but I, you know, grief does, does, does things to you. And, uh, the whole album, it's really about like the different stages between that and my anger towards everything. And I, I thought it could help someone uh, to see the other side of the, the coin. I thought it could help myself if I looked at it and I thought, well, if I write about it, it won't happen to me. <laughs> yeah, well, well, first of all, yeah. dude, luck, dude, all you got to do is call me and I'm there. I mean, I mean, it's not like <laughs> there was any luck in me, you know, playing on the, uh, you know, contributing that track, you know, that my vocal there, that that's like, all you guys got to do is call me, man. I'll show up. You know, that's not, I, I didn't mean luck. I meant just, <laughs> cause I, I know you would, you're a good guy and, and we're great friends. I, oh, yeah. I meant just, you know, we were really happy to, you know, uh, to get, I mean, I, I've listened to tunes for a long time and I was really loved you guys. So it was like with this album, you know, people are paying attention now. It's like, let's get some of my favorite artists on it. And uh, I, I not only got you, but there's another secret surprise that That's I right. think a lot of people are going to be like, what? Like, if you knew me growing up, people are going to shit their pants. <laughs> I shit my pants, you know? Yeah. I, I, I never thought something like that could be a reality. And um, it was really, really awesome. Just everything, you know, musically, I think the album is just really awesome. I think people are really going to like it. And my biggest hope is that, you know, people can relate to it and just be like, 
you know, I guess I'm not alone. You know, other people feel like this too. And, uh, that, you know, that's the scoop on the new album pretty much. Well, I mean, now, now it changes things, man. Like, you know, like I'm going to listen to it again with different, a different perspective, knowing all this stuff. And, and the other thing too, to keep in mind is like, it's crazy when you go through, you know, multiple losses like that and grief and you know, losing people that are close to you. It's like, it's, it's like a long process, dude. It's like a long grueling time that like a year will go by and then suddenly you, you're still not done with it, you know, until it's done with you, you're not done with it, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, my mom, even she talks all the time. She cannot believe the tragedy that I had to, uh, you know, endure from loss in my life. Uh, I, let's just even put this in perspective. The first friend I ever made in my entire life ended up passing away extremely early from just some, some sort of strange, tragic conditions. Uh, so it's, it's something that's been following me pretty much my whole life, but I didn't know how to deal with it. I never, I never learned how to deal with it until recently. And, um, it, you know, it kind of feels like I wrapped everything up and, and uh, things are going really well right before the album came out. It's like I, I had to go through this whirlwind to really teach myself and uh, basically start over in how I approach things and how I see the world and how I live because things could have been way worse. And <laughs> things are really fucking good now. Not but glad it was, to hear it, bro. It's that yeah. Definitely, you know, I'm so happy to hear that right now. Thank you, thank you. But it, it was it was sketchy for a while, you know. Um, and to me, that's that's the point of music, and that's also the my point in being so honest about what the album's about. Um, I didn't want to I didn't want to hide behind anything. Um, I know that people have a tendency to do that, and I've done it in the past too. I'd shrug it off. Like, yeah, maybe this song's about that. Maybe it's not. You can make up your own mind. But uh, on on this album, I'm like, no, this is this is what was going on, and uh, it it's real, it's visceral, and uh, you know it, it's pretty raw. I mean, I was really writing from the bottom of my heart, and you know, desperation, all of those feelings, and I, I really just wanted to to get those emotions across because I don't know it. I would like to one day write an album that's emotional and still real without having to go through sure. <laughs> all this. No, I totally so, did. Yeah. So, you know, my plan already is for the next album to be more positive because I'm always thinking that far in advance. The album hasn't even, it's not even going to be out until October, but I'm like, I, you know, I, I never want to go through something like this again and I never want to deal with it like this again. So the next time we're going to have, a, it's going to be a little lighter. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not going to get this dark anymore. I think one, one is enough. Yeah, no, definitely. That studio you guys worked out was really interesting, man. It was a pretty cool spot, you know, and how'd you find that place anyway? Um, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like searching online for like, you know, studios that sounded reasonable. Oh, I, I remember actually I, I was looking around for studios and I couldn't really find anything. And, uh, there was a band uh, on our label and they posted something like months and months and months ago at a really cool looking spot. And I was like, what is this place? So I went back, I, I tried to remember what the band was. I found it, I found the studio and I reached out and I was like, Oh man, I, I hope they respond. Like this place looks pretty cool. Like the gear rack is like crazy. And I, I, I hope they understand our sound because a lot of people don't, you know, they don't always know what we're going for because we're kind of, you know, we got a lot of different elements going and, you know, we're not a straight up doom band. We're not a death metal band. You know, it, we're not in a little tiny box. I'm not saying we're like Mr. Bungle, but a lot of people don't know where to place us. And uh, so I, I reached out to this guy. His name is John. He owns a studio um, in New Jersey called The Animal Farm, which is, it's quite literally a farm. And he got back to us and he's, you know, like telling us what he heard in our music and he was just like checking all the boxes, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. Yeah, that guy definitely gets it because like, you know, like I was there and, you know, there was well, nothing was mixed, obviously. It was just the, uh, you know, the tracks, you know, but it's everything sounded great, man. And like that dude, 
he's one of those gear master guys you know what i mean there's like mad stuff everywhere and really um you know real really competent engineer from what i can tell at that stage definitely yeah well he he's a teacher he knows his shit and he knows his theory and um there are a couple parts where you know i i thought what i was doing sounded fine and he would put his producer hat on and be like no uh i don't think that's actually in the correct key it sounds like it is but i don't think it is let's try it this way and in the back of my mind i'd be like dude come on just like let me do <laughs> like the, the, <laughs> just let me do it but he he would sit with me and uh you know there were, specifically i i remember uh the solo the guitar solo in marrow um one this the moment that i realized we had a really good song on our hands was he sat down with me and he played the part right before the solo and he sang it on an acoustic guitar and played it well obviously he sang it and played it on an acoustic guitar just stripped down and i did the solo over that and i was like you could take every element away and this is a great song yeah and that's cool yeah yeah, that was a that was a great feeling for me knowing that I you know that we wrote something like that and uh his suggestions ended up on the album because he he was completely right uh because he, he's very knowledgeable very easy to work with and I I mean I can't say enough good things about that studio and John just as a person there have been many Johns actually uh, involved in the making of this album our drummer is John John Forrestal uh, recorded the album, and then Jonathan Nunez from Torch, uh, he he mixed and mastered the album in Florida, which was another awesome thing for me because I've been a fan of that. I mean, like one of my like favorite albums is from that band. I remember hearing Neanderthal, like you know, when I I, I don't know maybe I was in high school, something like that. And I was like, this band is fucking amazing. So we reached out to him, and he was like, yeah, like this is awesome. Let's do it. He was super hands-on, super into it. So it's just like the stars aligned for us to just get what we wanted out of this record. We just could not be happier with how it came out. And I, I think a lot of people are really going to feel that, too, when they hear it. I really do. Wait, what's the actual release date on this again? October 6th. Okay, yeah, October 6th. Are there any singles or anything like that, like uh, you know, pre before the, uh, the record comes out? Yeah, so um, July 11th, which this podcast will be released uh, after that, will be the first single that's Marrow. We have a video. I actually just got back from uh, shooting a couple more scenes. There's a second day of shooting uh, at this really sick spot called uh, Threshold HQ in Amityville. Uh, so Marrow is going to get a video and a single, and then uh, there's going to be two more singles after that. And then the album will be there in October, and hopefully people will really enjoy it. Now, the video, is it uh, is there any kind of like uh, narrative or is this straight up like performance? Like what, what's a little bit about the video we can talk about? I don't know because we went back to, to shoot some B-roll, and I think it's going to add something to it. I mean, uh, originally we shot it, and it was kind of just straight performance, and then we went back and the label is like, I, I feel like, you know, we could do a little bit more with this. So we went back today and, you know, I love movies. I love writing. I love stuff like that. But when it comes to music videos and like narratives and stuff like that, I, I you know, I'm horseshit. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of just like, do what you want. Uh, so, you know, with that in mind, with the second day of shooting, I was still just like, if you have something in mind that you think would be good, because we went with the director that, uh, I think is really truly incredible. Her name is uh, Susan Susan Hunt, and uh, she directed a bunch of stuff for this band called Somnuri, um, who we're friends with. And I mean, just go check out those videos, and your mind's going to be blown. It's like she does she does great work. So there's going to be some sort of narrative, but uh, I will know that like within the week. <laughs> I just don't know what it is today. By the time this is released, I will I will have known. It's just today I don't know. Yeah, videos are interesting, man. And I think um, as like technology becomes uh, more and more populist in nature, where people have access to 
relatively inexpensive ways to make really quality things in the underground world like that you and I operate in, you know, more sort of uh, ambitious video narratives are going to become or becoming more normal, like more more of a normal thing to see with like a, on a lower budget, you know? Yeah, I, and, and that's where we're used to. But then we got to this spot the first day and she had like something called like a gimbal, which I still don't really know what it is. <laughs> she had <laughs> she had a jib. We used a green screen today. Oh, shit. She had like all this like equipment. It felt like a movie shoot. It was, it was it was super fucking cool experience. And I can't recommend her enough either. Everybody involved with this album. It's like, they're, you know, everything just went so awesome. And like I said, it, it was just a great experience all around. And... I, you know, I almost feel like it was sort of like fate in order for me to get this story out and, uh, you know, cleanse myself of, uh, you know, this tragedy and, and move forward with my life. That's killer, man. I'm, I'm really looking forward to all this stuff, man. Honestly, you know, it's going to be great to see the final product and, you know, the video and all that stuff. It sounds great. Yeah, thanks. And um, your song, I, I think, is absolutely one of my favorites i mean we definitely wrote that with you in mind also just oh, so dude. you know thank you man I, I it was great it was a blast hanging out and i had a lot of fun coming out there and you know kicking it with you guys and you know laying down the vocals like the whole thing was fun and it was cool to meet john you know and and the studio was cool and the vibe there is like real comfortable too you guys actually stayed there for for a while right we did and it was awesome until it wasn't <laughs> um, <laughs> because it, it, it was like mid November and a tr there was like a bad storm yep. and a, a tree knocked out all the power oh, and it was no. like, yeah, dude, like one of the last days we were there and it, I woke up at like three or four o'clock in the morning and uh, I have, I have sleep apnea. So I, I, I've been using a CPAP since I was 17. So if the power goes out, I'm going to know because my machine is going to stop working. So I woke up, I was like, what the fuck is going on right now? Why am I freezing? And I can't breathe right now. Oh, no. So there, there was no power uh, until like very, very late in that day. And I got super sick, super, super, super sick. And that was like the second day of doing vocals. Oh, no way, man. That sucks. And I, 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 got, the, I got the vocal tracks back. And I was like, this sounds really good, but like, what does it sound like without the auto tune? Cause I know for a fact, I did not sound like that. He's like, dude, I did not touch it. That's how you sounded that day. And I was like, that's pretty cool. That made me feel pretty good about myself. That's awesome, man. That that's damn. What a, what a fucking experience. <laughs> you know, that sucks. Yeah, it, it was awesome. We'd like wake up every day and hang out with the chickens and the cows and get breakfast and, you know, um, just the cold, you know, on, on those last couple of days doing vocals was, uh, that, that was, that was rough, but we were record at night. So like the, you know, most of the days we just hang out and like play Nintendo 64 and just have a good time. You know, like when you, when you were there, we didn't start recording until like six or something like that. We just like, you know, hung out on the couch, just talked and caught up. And it was a really good experience to be with my bandmates and, you know, see friends and uh you know just take the take the whole thing in yeah it was, like i said it was a lot of fun going out there and uh, i do remember it being freezing too actually now that you mention it you know it was pretty chilly at that that time of year yeah it, it was absolutely freezing and having no power in there was not <laughs> not comfortable dude i was so cold I, I i get like flashbacks thinking about how sick i was now before well, Leading up to this conversation, you mentioned something about some kind of a sound garden uh, tribute record that you guys are contributing a track to. What, what's the what's the story with that? Okay, so that um, actually this is going to be this is going to be a, a pretty busy week because the single is going to come out, and then this podcast is going to come out, and then July fourteenth, the sound garden comp is going to come out, and uh, our label asked if we wanted to be a part of it, and um, another thing that just like felt like it's fate was uh i never really got into Soundgarden really until yeah until like i would say like five years ago something like that okay and uh i, I heard uh room a thousand years wide mm -hmm. that's a great song and I was, 
yeah, I was like, dude, this song is amazing. I, I, I feel like one day I would love to cover this song. Like, I, I would really, really like to cover this song. A couple of years later, we get asked to do a Soundgarden, like a best of Soundgarden thing. And, uh, you know, he told me the songs that were taken. I was like, hey, what about like Broom a Thousand Years Wide? He was like, go for it. Um, he, as in Jad, our, our, you know, our label guy. And uh, we went in the studio, knocked it out. I, I think it came out super awesome. Like, it's one of those songs where it just like kicks ass the whole time. And I, I, I felt like it really fit our vibe. So I didn't feel the need to overwork it and change it just for the sake of changing it. Um, so we, we did it pretty close to the original, but we just put a little bit of our own twist because we didn't want to ruin it. Sometimes I feel songs are so good and then they get covered and they get messed with a little too much and it takes it it takes the feel and the character out of the song and it's like why'd you do that <laughs> i mean that, that makes a lot of sense to me because i mean when i when i listen to you guys i can hear like a you know like a danzig influence for sure you know and and but independent of this like even when we did that tour together last year i was like man these guys like there's like a danzig thing which i like and there's like a Soundgarden thing, you know, because I, I I felt that back then before even having this conversation with you, because like you know before you, we were talking about like what people categorize the band as, and like when I first heard you guys, I was like, you know, whatever Danzig on Danzig one and two was is what you guys are, you know, what I mean like a heavy rock with like some kind of like a little bit of a blues thing going on, like he just heavy rock music, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's the best way to describe us, too, because even a band like Soundgarden, it's like you could call them grunge, but that's just like a blanket term. Yeah. There's so, there's so much more than that. And I didn't realize the similarities that we have with Soundgarden until I really started listening to them. Because, I, you know, I was never a big fan of um, uh, Black Hole Sun. And, yeah. and that was like the most that I knew of them. But then I went back and I listened to those early. I was like, dude, this band is like Black Sabbath. Yeah, no, totally. I, I, that, that's when I first found out about him was like back in you know back in that era when they were just it was so they were so unique i thought especially compared to the stuff i was listening to at the time you know it was until like death metal and all this other stuff and then you hear a band like that with a guy like chris cornell rest, you know rest in peace you know singing and it was suddenly this whole thing of like like a modern zeppelin sabbath thing but just more evil you know and and, and it's just a different type of vibe and uh, yeah, like some of the riffs that you have and, and the vocals and all that stuff in, in Russell's spirit is like, I was like, oh yeah, it's like a it's Danzig, Soundgarden, all that stuff kind of mixed together, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the Danzig came naturally because yeah. I love Danzig, but it, the Soundgarden similarities was completely by mistake because like I said, I'd never really listened to them uh, before, you know, well into the band had already been a band. So maybe it wasn't five or six years ago, but it was... It was a while ago because wow. me, me, Mark, and John started playing together in uh, 2016. So I, I, I don't know. I think I got before that, actually. I don't know. Our, our, our uh, history is very confusing and convoluted. Ah, it's so it's, interesting, though. I, lo I love hearing that when it's like you think you have it pegged, like what bands, oh, yeah, these guys listen to this, and you find out that they're like, you know, you, they don't. <laughs> you know, it's like it's yeah. interesting, you know. No, I, I mean, I, I got super into them, but I, I didn't realize the similarities. And, and then I heard them and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Like, I, I, I hear it now, but it's, uh, it, it's totally, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Unintended. Yeah. So one of the things you guys were, t I know we were texting about this a while back. Um, you know, you, you, you and I both have a love for horror films and, you know, horror novels and literature and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, one of the biggest, um, events this year was the, the evil dead rise movie that came out. So I'm, I, I'm really interested to hear what your thoughts are, are on that film. My thoughts are this. <laughs> eh. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. You know, and, and that's a bummer. And, uh, so let me preface this by saying we've talked a bunch about I love shit, you know? I, I love just, like, popcorn, junk, horror movies. Like, just sometimes you don't need good characters all the time. Sometimes you just want, like, you know, a movie like The Burning or uh, The Mutilator 
or any yeah. of those eighties slashers where right. it's just it's it, it's junk food. But Evil Dead has a much higher standard. You can't get away with that and then slap Evil Dead onto it. You can't. You start with Bruce Campbell. You gotta have strong acting, strong stories, and uh, you know I don't I don't care if the vibe is Evil Dead ish. You need you need good characters, and I felt personally the characters in this movie, I they just did not seem believable to me, and they didn't seem memorable, and um, it it kind of killed the whole thing for me. The setting was cool, the effects were cool. The music was fine. Actually, the music is really good. I like that. And, and the sound design. But it really came down to just the characters and really not caring much about the story. I also felt there was a strange thing that I kept noticing where it was like something really bad and scary would happen. And the characters, like the feeling I got was like, oh, yeah, I'm, suppo- I'm supposed to like run away. And then they would just like jog. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or just like s- s- something about, I don't know if it was just in the editing, something about it was just off. And I, very disappointing for me, um, especially because I'm a big fan of the remake. I think that the remake got a lot of things right. I I, I really like the characters. I like the story. Um, and also that ending, man, in the remake with the just, you know, like tons and tons and tons of literally raining blood. Yeah. You can't, you can't top that. I mean, I, I was trying to think, like, how are they going to top that? And I think the ending to Evil Dead Rise was cool, um, but it, it, it was not the same type of spectacle. I mean, that was like a showdown from hell. It was like you were watching hell in the apocalypse, and I didn't, I didn't get that vibe from the new movies. No, I, I like the Fetty Alvarez movie, especially as, over time. You know what I mean? Like I, I've actually I like it more now than I did back in whenever it came out, like in twenty ten or whatever the year was. And um and I liked it fine, but I, I actually appreciate it a lot more today than I did back then. Yeah, I, I don't know. I was super into it. There there are a bunch of scenes in that movie that really stuck with me and really grossed me out. And I felt like the characters really gave a good sense of like like it felt real, something horrifying. And, and they get like mutilated and they got like this like confused look like, what's happening? Like just this like dazed sort of like in such shock. And they really got like the terror of, you know, like that, that, w- that one girl who like cut her own arm off with like the, 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 the meat cutter, the roast beef slicer or whatever. That always stuck with me. Yeah, it was real mean spirited for sure. You know, the remake yeah. is it had a very mean like vibe to it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Evil Dead Rise, I mean, it's just there's I didn't have that much to say about it because I, the story was just like, I don't know. It's OK. I was really disappointed in the story. I mean, we covered all this stuff on Necromaniacs, but um, it was like very like there was so many good opportunities. Like the the concept of the story was interesting. But just the execution of it, I thought, was just a failure, honestly. Yeah, it, it really was. And um, I don't know. I think there, there are multiple fingers to be pointed. Uh, and there are just too many, too many flaws that I saw. I will say that it, you know, it's not as bad as I was super underwhelmed by, uh, and we talked about this, the new, the new Hellraiser oh, installment. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I hate it more now than I did when I first saw that movie. It's like... Same. I think I was like pretty easy on it. I don't remember how we talked about it on the podcast. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I, I think about it now. It's like it was bad. Or like the newest... I mean, Texas Chainsaw also, that has like the worst track record of any fucking franchise. Oh, yeah. They, um, they never yeah. get that right, man. Ever. You know what I mean? No. So... <laughs> So it's like, you know, these three franchises that I really loved, you know, they all had new releases and it was just like stinker after stinker after stinker. And so I'm just like, I don't know. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to uh, the newer franchises. Like, I don't know if we ever covered this on, on the podcast, but you know, like the, I don't even know what you would call the franchise, but I guess the X franchise or maybe the, the Pearl franchise. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a fresh idea. You know, I'm looking forward to the the was it um the the last one is uh 
the next one that's coming out, the third one, and I forgot the, t- the title of it. But that's interesting, man. It's like a new, new, brand new idea. You know, I mean, obviously inspired by like you know older films, but it's fresh, you know. And I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, it was really great. And I remember uh, you and I talked personally about Pearl. It took me a while to see it, and I, I wasn't a big fan of it when I first saw it, and, and then uh, it, it took some time growing me, but I really ended up liking it. I still like the first one much better, but, um, you know, not for nothing. I'm just interested that they have a character like this, and, and they're really pushing it further and delving deeper, and for that alone, I'm happy that the franchise exists, and, uh, I, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's more than a third one, and they can keep this streak going, because I don't know. We we've had enough bad franchises come and go, and I'm I'm just I'm tired of it, man. <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> man. And you know, and it's like I, I just I don't want to see any more old stuff being remade. No more, no more Halloween. No more, you know, Evil Dead. No more, none of that stuff. I just want new ideas, and and I don't know why. I mean, there are tons of other independent filmmakers like like Benson and Moorhead, like guys like that. They got great ideas, and I'd rather that be the thing that people get excited about than like some rehash bullshit cash in, you know? Yeah, well, you know, I, sometimes I, I think about like the state of horror, and I'm a little underwhelmed. But then I think, you know, I personally, and I know I'm the minority, I'm not a big fan of Terrifier at all. Yeah. It just doesn't do anything. People go crazy for Terrifier, and that's awesome. You know, Art the Clown. I think I think it's really cool. It's really scary, and people really love the franchise. And um, I think that's a step in the right direction. You know, his next movie is going to get a, a a bigger budget, and uh, you know, Terrifier two did extremely well. So, you know, it, it's not like there's no hope, but it, it really is. It's just time. You know, I I was never against remakes, but at this point, it's just like I keep being proven like. I keep being an optimist about it and then getting disappointed. So, uh, you know, I'm happy that Terrifier exists despite my, uh, you know, I'm not too into it, but I'm really happy people like it. Seems like a fresh idea. Uh, you know, I'm super into Pearl X, whatever the franchise is. And, you know, I think I, I would like for more directors to, to go that route and sort of explore like it like look it can be done we can new have new horror icons i think that pearl is going to be one i really do i i know that uh art the clown already is one so it's like i i hope these movies inspire people to really just be like let's start something new like let's start something fresh and let's just keep going man (laughs) let's look forward no, totally, man. And like, you know, like, like I, yeah, I, I actually do like Terrifier quite a bit. I mean, you know, it's, I, that's just my taste, you know, and, and the, um, and I do feel like the Pearl thing, like is, is definitely, uh, you know, another iconic character. And that's what I mean. Like, I'm, I'm with you on that. Let's just not, let's just leave all the Friday the 13th and everything in the past because they were great, you know, and we don't need to ruin them and drag them through the mud. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like a couple uh, franchises had potential, like uh, Hatchet, Victor Crowley. Yeah, mm-hmm. That was pretty good. But he almost, I don't know, that really never seemed to take off. And, and most people don't really remember Hatchet and, and go back to that and see him as like a modern horror icon. But I, I thought it had the potential. It, maybe it was just like wrong place, wrong time for for long lasting impact cuz i know people like those movies i mean i like the first one a lot i've rewatched yeah. it a bunch of times but it you know you don't hear many people talking about it these days i feel like the hatchet thing predated the kind of like big horror uh you know revital you know revitalization by a little couple of years maybe and that might like if it came out now i think it would have been a hit a little harder with people you know yeah and then i i mean you know you had um you know, Jeepers Creepers. Uh, but, you know, that whole situation was just marred by the director. Yes, yeah, exactly. And, you know, so that that one's out, which really fucking sucks. I mean, the whole situation tra- surrounding it sucked. And not only that, like, apparently, uh, I think they made a third. Maybe they made a fourth. I don't know. But that was like, I'm not even going to watch that. 
Yeah. And apparently it was just beyond awful to begin with. So it should have never been made. Um, but, you know, like there were a lot, you know, in the past, like uh, iconic characters that really never got their due, like uh, Pumpkinhead, you know, that wow. franchise. <laughs> It's not, it's not a good franchise, but the first movie is awesome. The first one's great, you know, and and uh, yeah, with Lance Hendrickson, like that's a classic film, man. The first one, you know, and the second one, not so much, you know. Uh, Candyman, you know, I know that they uh, they, Candyman, they, yeah, yeah, they tried to remake or do whatever they did with it, and I thought that failed too, honestly. Um, you know, the second Candyman was no good, but the first one, you know, it's based on that Clive Barker story, and I thought that was awesome, you know. Yeah. But even so, like we're, t we're talking about this, right? And we're talking about going, moving forward. Candyman, Pumpkinhead. We're talking about movies from like the 80s, early 90s and shit. And uh, so it's like, wh what, what do we have now? You know, like who, who are our horror heroes? <laughs> or, yeah, well, I mean, our, you know, our favorite guys, villains. You know, guys like, like the, you know, Benson and Moorhead, they're, they've been doing really cool stuff. Um, uh, Brandon, uh, the Canadian guy there, <laughs> fucking, um, uh, the guy who did, uh, Infinity Pool. Why the hell am I forgetting his name now? Um, Infinity Pool, uh, uh, Possessor. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, Brandon Cronenberg. Brandon Cronenberg. David Cronenberg's yeah. son. Yeah. yeah. Great. I think he's, uh, definitely, you know, and on, on a, like a more independent level, the, uh, the, the Adams family. I don't know if you checked out any of their movies. No, nah. dude. All right. They're well they're, at this point, they're friends of mine now because I've had them. I've interviewed them a bunch of times and, you know, we correspond quite a bit. But they they have a, a couple of films out. They started out more as like dramas, you know, but then they, they started doing horror films and uh, they have a movie called The Deeper You Dig. And that's the one that's still my favorite. There's a movie called The Hatred, which is a short. And then there's uh, one that came out last year called Hellbender. And currently, they're working on a, another film that I don't know if it's going to be late 23 or early 24 release, but they're constantly cranking out material. It's completely independent. Uh, you can see their stuff on Shutter and on the Arrow uh, service. And uh, yeah, really, really good, solid filmmaking. I'll have to check that out. You know, I'm still, I'm still a monster kid. Yeah, you know, like I, I still I, I go and uh, whenever I could find like the old famous monsters magazines, I collect them. I have a room in my house where it's just we call it the monster room because I have creature from the Black Lagoon memorabilia. Sure, and I mean, you know, it looks like a, a, a kid's room. It's just I had to afford everything I I, I never could when I was a, a child. So uh, I I really I want some new good monster movies to come out or new good like villains to latch on to and be like what's going to happen in the sequel how are they going to bring them back but I, maybe there's a part of me that thinks that that's just in the past and it doesn't really fly in this day and age you know like michael myers just dying and coming back i think that modern audiences want a little more realism and they're sort of like, yeah, yeah, that's not going to fly. That well, would never happen. Yeah, you know, the the one movie that did have a, a pretty good monster, you didn't like it. You didn't like Terrifier. <laughs> like that, that had like that's, you know, true. that's true. That's true. You know, that's but, very uh, true. But you know, maybe maybe the third one will, will maybe that'll be the one that hooks you in. You know, I will say though that I, I definitely did like the second one much more than the first one. Um, yeah, I, I also think that possibly I was looking at Terrifier two through the wrong lenses because. Um, you know, I flip flop between saying you don't always need like great characters, you don't need great acting as long as the monster is good. And my my uh, whole complaint fire too is it just I don't know. I the acting to me didn't feel that strong, and um, that kind of killed it for me. Uh, so I got to go back and, and really look at it from a more like let's say like childish. And I don't want to say that anyone that loves that movie is childish, but for me. My fixation has always been with the monster and, and the big bad and everything else is secondary. So I, I really got to go back and, and look at it through that lens and hopefully I'll like it because it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. No, and there's going to be more. You, for sure there is. I, I would love to get on that train. I never want to be that guy that's like, 
everybody likes it, so I hate it. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to like everything. That's why I, I, that's why I get sad. Very good. I, I want everything to be great. Well, n- not for nothing. The first one, I, did, I didn't like it nearly as much as the second one. Because the second one had this epic fucking story that they were unfolding. You know, this, like, backstory. Like, it got, like, kind of sword and sorcery for a minute, you know. And it was just, like, it was, like, this uh, aggregate of all these things that I liked, you know, there's like slasher stuff. There's like this fantasy element. There's like, you know, magic. There's like all this stuff in there, you know, and it was really cool. I thought. Yeah. I think my other thing with it is just, it felt a little too long. Like I felt a lot of the, the scenes, like they just lingered. Yeah. And I thought that for me, like it was hard to keep my attention because it's like two and a half hours, isn't it? Something yeah, that, like that? that's I can see that. I mean, I, I I tend to agree with you on that. Like that, maybe it's not so much that scenes themselves needed to be cut out, but maybe the editing could have been tightened up a bit. Yeah, so I think I think that there was probably a really good movie for me hidden in there. Right. Uh, but on first watch, you know, I, I saw it once. I actually watched it on Halloween. Um. And I was just kind of just overwhelmed, cause I, uh, underwhelmed because I heard so many great things. And I was just like, oh, my God, this feels so long. It felt like a chore, which obviously is not a good thing for any movie. But I liked every time I saw Art the Clown. There were a lot of really super gory and just scary parts. Like when, when uh, the girl uh, put her hand in the box of cereal and it was like, just it, I don't remember if it was like glass or syringes or just something horrible like that. Yeah. One of her dream sequences. Well, I mean, the, the, there was many set pieces in that film that were just very like extreme, man. You're, and, and the thing is, you know, honestly, I'm not a big fan of like extreme horror, you know, in and of itself. But there has to be something more to the story than just like gore. And I feel like there was definitely this movie also had that. It had extreme stuff in it, but it also had a story. And I thought it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I feel like the, the, the length or possibly the editing took the, the thrill out of it for me because it was just like, it was a lot to take in and uh, it just, it just felt like drawn out to me. And I, I was super disappointed, like I said, because I really wanted to like it. But on the other side of that coin, um, I do think I was probably looking through it, looking at it through a, a lens that I shouldn't have. And I never went back and rewatched it, although I definitely meant to. So yeah. I, I'm going to have to, because the more people talk about it, the more I'm like, what the fuck am I missing? <laughs> you know, you know, it'd be you know? interesting if like, if, if another edit did come out, you know how like, you know, that, that happens all the time with they'll, they'll, they'll have different cuts of films. You know what I mean? Like exorcist three, there's like several, two different cuts of that movie. And, um, like I would be interested to see if if uh, Damien had someone else edit it for him to tighten it up and make it you know like a, a ninety minute film or something like that you know. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing that I felt bad for criticizing him for because I know that he edited it himself. He did a lot. Of he the did the whole. Himself. He did everything. He was like he was like the you know yeah. the, the Greg Ginn of that movie. You know what I mean? So it's like, of course, he's going to want every single frame in the movie, yeah. and I, I I can't I can't blame the guy, but. You know, that's one of that's uh, it goes back to even what I was talking about, like John for Forstall to be like, hey, that part is good. Let's change it up a little bit. And I feel like sometimes even when directors, when they don't have someone to, to do something like that, like uh, Danzig's movie. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when yep. you don't have someone to say like, hey, let's think about this a, a little bit or the greatest example of all time would be the room. Yeah. Um when you don't have someone, you know, sort of uh, doing a spell check on it, sometimes things, they, they get a little bit out of control. And I feel like that's why you need a solid team. But with that said, hats off to Damien Leone because that is an incredible feat. I, I believe I also heard it's the longest slasher film ever. I, I would believe that. Um, it is a very epic uh, film, for especially for that genre, you know? Yeah. So I, I think conversation has inspired me to go back and and rewatch it, um, and hopefully, hopefully, I'll like it more because that's always the goal. You know, I, I never want to go into a movie saying this is gonna suck. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, totally. I'm I'm not the, I'm not, I know there's so many like jaded horror fans, but like I am not one of them. I get excited and a lot of shit still really. That's why I watch it. I like feeling scared. Well, Paul, thanks a lot for taking time out to talk to us, man. I appreciate this. Yeah, man. Anytime.
this has been, you know, every time I'm on the show, it's it's really awesome. And love talking to you. And it's, it's great. No. All right, man. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.